So what are some ultimate questions? Where do we come from? What is our value and worth? Why is there evil, death, and suffering? Is it possible to know God? How? What happens after death? Where are your answers coming from? Now, the vast majority of students you'll be witnessing to have never had their worldviews scrutinized. And so when you ask questions to scrutinize their worldview, it can be a bit traumatic for themselves. Why? Because they've never had the Socratic method applied to their worldview. And what is, this, what is the Socratic method? Tell me what you believe and why you believe what you believe. And tell me why you believe that to be an authoritative source for what you believe. Now, they've never gone that deep. They've never drilled down that deep. So it's, it's very arresting for them to hear that. Now, we know from numerous passages of Scripture that people come into the world uh, born enemies of God, born rebels of God. And so uh, when people come into the world, they're controlled by uh, the original lie that was in the Garden of Eden. And what was that lie? It was an offer of autonomy. It was an offer of independence from God. That the Word of God is suspect, and you can determine right and wrong for yourself. You can determine truth for yourself. So part of our task in worldview evangelism is to make people aware of the philosophies they've assembled. And so we employ questions that bring that person's worldview to the surface so it can be discussed. Now, I don't necessarily tell my unsaved friends this, but every single philosophy outside of the gospel is traceable to the lie of the garden. Kant, Spinoza, Hegel, you name it, every false philosophy is traceable to the original lie in the Garden of Eden. It's just been embellished in new permutations and nuances of an attitude. So when I'm talking to my unsafe friends, I use in evangelism the uh, green light, yellow light, red light system. Have you heard about that? In that particular system, I'll continue to ask questions and proclaim the gospel until I get a somewhat vociferous argument. That means a yellow light. So when I get the yellow light, I go back to questions instead of proclamation. Now, proclamation is good. As long as you have a green light, you can proclaim and preach. But when I get a strong, vehement answer and debate, I don't try to win the argument. I go back to questions. I go back to what's called questioning evangelism. I go back to building the relationship. Letting the person know I respect them. I don't have a controlling agenda that, that is more powerful than my care for them. I want them to know my care for them is even stronger than my agenda. What is a red light? A red light is where the argument becomes very insulting, a lot of invective. Uh, that's, that's time to pause. Let things cool down, go back to questions. So we use questions to find a person's working epistemology. Now, I know that's a big word, but because you folks major in evangelism, I'm not afraid to share that with you. Epistemology is how we know what we know. In other words, I want to find that person's source of authority and their starting point, and I want to hear from their own lips why they have chosen self as opposed to God's self-revelation. Now, I'm coming back from a missions trip in Africa, and uh, I was on a jet from Frankfurt, Germany, to Los Angeles, and uh, I decided to witness to some Germans in the back of the plane who were standing up, <clears throat> and one was an Airbus pilot, the other was an attorney, after we just talked about why we're all going to California, I said, uh, well, I'm a missionary, probably never see you guys again. Would you mind if I asked you some, some, some religious questions? And they kind of took a step back to, well, okay. I said, what's the number one reason you don't base your lives on God's word in the Bible? I don't always ask that question. I just felt like asking that question that day. And, um, they both said the same thing. Well, the Bible is a collection of moral advice, like any other book of moral advice. But uh, it's nothing more than that, because we know that supernatural events can't happen. This is a material universe. So we don't put any stock in it other than it's moral advice. 
I said, well, that's interesting. Um, do you know what the conscience is? Can you tell me what it is and where it came from? Can you trace evil back to its origin? And I had a series of five or six questions for them. And I said, can you answer any of those questions with certainty? They said, no, not one. I said, then you might want to take another look at the Word of God. Because it answers those questions with authority and with certainty. It explains your human experience. So what is the biblical point of contact with the unbeliever? Is it that the unbeliever needs information? Is it that the unbeliever needs a high enough stack of proofs and evidences that the Bible is true? What is the point of contact with the unbeliever? Well, I think if we study the evangelistic sermons in the book of Acts, and we study the discourses of our Lord, we will find something right away that the point of contact with the unbeliever is the unbeliever's rebellion. The point of contact with the unbeliever is the unbeliever's dilemma and predicament as defined by God, that his sin has separated him from his maker. So the point of contact with the unbeliever, though the conversation may go toward apologetics, the point of contact is actually the unbeliever's dilemma, his predicament, that he has been ruined by sin. God's sight. <clears throat> now part of that ruin is the fact that unbelievers barricade themselves inside their false worldviews in order to lock out the gospel. The very thing they need to be right with God and to make sense of the world, they have locked out the gospel with their erroneous worldviews. They've barricaded themselves inside. <clears throat> now as Ray Comfort brings out, Though this castle, this fortress against the knowledge of God, is locked so tight and so fully fortified, there's a spy inside. And that spy inside is the conscience. The conscience is put there by God, and the Lord has written on that conscience in a rudimentary fashion His moral law. When I say rudimentary fashion, it's because most unbelievers cannot give you all ten of the Ten Commandments. It's written there in a rudimentary fashion. Romans 2, 14 through 16. And so I go into every witnessing situation knowing that my unsaved friend has a spy in his heart. And I want to talk to that spy. I had a really great example of this. A few years ago in my condo complex, uh, a very beefed up guy with huge biceps was walking a dog with a spike collar. <clears throat> and the guy wasn't all tatted up or anything. He didn't look like he's a gang member or something. He just looked like he works out a lot and has a, a boxer dog with a spike collar. So I walked up to him and I just started making a small talk. Hey, heard about how the coyotes are taking some pets around here, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't look like your dog would have a problem. You could handle himself. Just making some small talk. And then uh, I said, uh, what do you do for a living? You know, after we introduced ourselves, our names, he goes, oh, I'm a finance guy at an auto dealership. He says, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a Bible teacher at a college. He goes, oh, you are a Bible teacher at a college. I, I, I'll have to ask you some questions about the Bible someday. And I go, oh, how brave are you? He goes, what do you mean brave? I said, truth is not an abstract theoretical issue. When you hit upon the truth, you know automatically your life has to be conformed to it. It's not abstract. He goes, yeah, I guess that's a fact, isn't it? When you get a hold of the truth, you have to conform your life to it. That's true. And I said, uh, but also, you have to be objective to receive the truth. And I said, would you like to find out how objective you are? This is only two minutes into the conversation with this guy. He goes, okay. I said, are you married? No. I said, do you have a, do you have a girlfriend? Yeah. Do you sleep with her? Yeah. I said, there goes your objectivity. He goes, what do you mean? I said, let me read to you John 3, 19 through 21. That God's testimony is that men love darkness rather than the light. And they won't come to the light for fear of exposure, lest their deeds should be exposed. You hate the truth because when the truth shines into your life, you would have to admit you're a fornicator. I'm only five minutes into the conversation now. Now, did he cock his arm back to hit me? No. He said, let's walk. 
let's talk, let's walk and talk. And so walking with him and walking with his dog, and after we walked about 20 minutes, he goes, uh, well, let's exchange contact information. So we did. And uh, my wife and I dropped over to his condo unannounced about 9 o'clock the next week. He goes, come on in, come on in. And he brings out his roommates and his very beautiful live-in girlfriend. And we're all sitting around his table. And I'm presenting the gospel to him. And uh, all of a sudden his girlfriend goes, you know, after about 45 minutes, his girlfriend goes, you know, that's all so convenient. That you just do whatever you want, and then Jesus forgives you. That's all so convenient. And she goes, do you have any proof for this? Now, I knew she was not asking for a presentation in apologetics. And so I said this. I said, Monique, how would you feel if you found out your boyfriend did not love you, but he was using you? How would you feel? She was terrible. I said, do you realize that all love is from God? And the people most equipped to love are the people who are receiving love from God. Anyway, then I went back to my evangelism. Didn't give her any proofs at all. We bring the gospel to people unproven. There are times for evidences, but we bring the gospel to people unproven. That's an important point. By the end of that night, she says, oh, do you have to leave already? And then he said this, the live-in boyfriend said this, we want to have you back over, we're going to invite more people, we're going to cook a, a, an Italian dinner of four courses, and we want you to do this again. It's the only time an unsaved, cohabitating couple has organized an evangelistic dinner party. Only time. Well, as a result of that, she moved out. He lost his job. Although he was reading the Bible every day and asking me more questions. I finally lost contact with him. But my wife and I were hiking up at Towsley Canyon about a year later. And she was walking with a Christian girlfriend. And her life was changed. And so some of our boldness, dear brothers, isn't always an immediate, an immediate proclamation of trying to get every part of the gospel out. Some of it involves finding where the person's at. See, because one of the things he shared with me while he was walking his dog that first day, he goes, I just want you to know that in working for that finance company for three years, I've only lied once. And I turned to him and I said this, Jason, only God can justify a person. You're trying to justify yourself. And this weightlifting guy turned beet red. He turned absolutely red because he realized I was speaking to his conscience. Only God can justify it. And that's when he offered to, to exchange contact information. So just understanding what kind of lies our unsaved friends have imbibed. I mean, the great watershed, the great continental divide is Colossians 2.8. That's the great continental divide. Either you are liberated by Christ and the truth has made you free, or you've been taken captive by some form of philosophy. There's nothing in between. Now, the people you're witnessing to will pretend like they're safe on some demilitarized neutral ground. They'll pretend like they occupy gray areas. And so part of our job is to take away what they think they have. And what do they think they have? A decent chance of heaven. We've got to take that away. They think they've got a decent chance of heaven. They don't. You've got to take away what they think they have. Well, those are pictures I took at uh, Venice Beach, except the one on the far right. <clears throat> so I begin with this. Knowing that the unbeliever has chosen his worldview to Free up the desires of the flesh. I like what Del Tackett says here. Because within the selfish fallen world, erroneous worldviews appeal to the desires of the flesh. And so people choose an erroneous worldview to free up or give permission.
to the desires of their flesh. And I can't tell you how many times that has emerged when I've been sharing the gospel. Now, what is our great problem in boldness and evangelism? Our great problem in boldness and evangelism is we look at the world and we say, man, there's hundreds if not thousands of religious options out there. Now, two weeks ago, I just got back from ministering in India and Burma. India, a majority Hindu country. Burma, a majority Buddhist country. The devotion of these people to Buddhism in Burma is incredible. From the time you get up in the morning until you go to bed at night, chanting from the pagodas, Buddhist prayers and chants. Everybody's life goes around Buddhism to some degree. And so, how does this impact our boldness in evangelism? Sometimes we get this attitude and it makes us lack boldness. Here's the attitude. We believe that the natural man has no more reason to believe in Christ than Buddha or Mohammed. We think that the natural man has no more reason to believe in Christ than the Bhagavad Gita or the Quran. And why do we believe that? It's because we have not believed Romans 1, 18 through 23 at the depth God wants us to believe. If we believe this to the depth God wants us to believe it, we would believe that God's general revelation is infallible. That does not mean it's salvific. No one is brought to a saving knowledge of Christ through general revelation. They must hear the gospel and embrace it. But general revelation is a powerful witness of God that cannot be extinguished. No matter how much unbelievers suppress the truth and unrighteousness, they cannot extinguish this that since the creation of the world is invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they're without excuse. That cannot be fully extinguished. See, when an unbeliever hears the word of God, perhaps for the first time, there is a work of correspondence between general and special revelation taking place in his mind and heart, though he's fighting it with all his might. When he hears special revelation, the correspondence is saying this, the God I always knew who was there, the God I always knew who created me, the God to whom I will give an account on judgment day, I'm now hearing about him in this book. Think how much more bold an evangelism you would be if you believe it. Quite a bit. I was witnessing to a really cocky guy at Calvin's. He had a couple of other students around him, and he, and he said some really tough things. He said, you know, I'm not that impressed with the students at Master's College. He says, I've even dated a couple of girls from Master's College. Do you see what they told me? He said, they told me I don't have to be that concerned with the Old Testament because everything that's happening in God's work is in the New Testament now. He goes, last time I checked, the Old Testament was the Bible of the early church. And then we started talking about Spinoza and Kant and all these other philosophers. And, and as we're talking, he said, well, I'm, I'm, he spoke of himself. He says, well, I'm sort of a, a solipsist Spinoza and blah, 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 blah. And as I'm making proclamations of absolute truth, he goes, why do you keep scuttling the conversation by making absolute statements of mutual exclusivity? He goes, why do you do that? He goes, can't we just have a conversation and respect everybody's view? So I just started praying privately, Lord, you know, show me how to handle this guy. And so I said, uh, Bill, has anybody ever shared with you what God says about your particular worldview. He goes, no. I said, may I? He goes, yeah, go ahead. All I did was very slowly read Romans 1, 18 through 23. And this guy got really quiet. He just he cocked his head. It was like the RCA dog. He cocked his head. Why he was hearing the voice of God in the word of God. He was hearing special revelation, and there was a correspondence going on in his heart between general and special revelation. 
at that point. He says, oh man, man, I gotta go to class, I'm out of here. You see, nothing shook him up until he heard the word. So there's only two starting points, either God's self-revelation or self. And the unbeliever's method of knowing, which is self, is what makes him a fool. According to Romans 1, it is the unbeliever's method of knowing, his epistemology, which makes him a fool in God's sight. He is committing folly by doing what? He suppresses the truth and unrighteousness. He stops giving thanks. He speculates and then he pronounces himself wise. He exchanges the truth of God for the lie and he, and he puts God out to pasture and ex exchanges the glory of God for that image of creeping things. He gives credit to amoebas for his origin instead of to the God of the universe. He loses his glory. He loses rationality in the process. So these worldview questions form an excellent starting point. Jesus and Paul continually used antithesis in their evangelism. They set up the false worldview against the biblical worldview, and they showed the contrast and the consequences of each. So the biblical events of creation, fall, redemption, restoration, those four beats are a summation of the entire human history and future. And those four beats are the most compassionate and realistic explanation of human experience imaginable because it's God's perspective on human history. Look how many questions are answered by this. How is it that a human being can be so noble and another human being so cruel? Why is there evil, death, and suffering? Why do we want to get back to the garden? Why do we love beauty so much? These four points form a diagnostic to analyze every single worldview and every single worldview claim. And so we take these four beats of human history and we put them into four worldview questions and we simplify the conversation with unbelievers by asking these four worldview questions. And I've done this hundreds of times. I'll walk up to an unbeliever and say, do you know what worldview is? It's, it's the combined view you have of life. It's your combined life view. How would you like to find out what your worldview is? Would you mind if I just ask you four worldview questions? Sure, go ahead. I've done this so many times. And I'd have to say nobody has said no. They all are willing to do it. First question, who made you and me? Where did we come from? Second question, what is our value and purpose? Why do we have dignity? Question number three, what's gone wrong with the world? Question number four, what can we do to fix it? Now, the more educated a person is, by secular standards, the more often they will answer number four in this way. We need a mandatory, government-organized, compulsory re-education system. I'm thinking, hey, Stalin tried that, Pol Pot tried that, Mao Zedong tried that, and it resulted in holocausts. And so, once I ask the four questions and listen to them respectfully, I will then ask this question. Has anyone ever shared with you the biblical answer to these four questions? No. May I do that? Yes. What did they just give you permission to do? To preach the gospel. They just gave you permission. They just asked you to preach the gospel. They just asked you to give them the gospel. But I've listened to them first. I've found out their worldview. I've done a, di a diagnostic of their worldview. There was a guy uh, with headphones on, drumming on a, on a, um, a drum, the, tip, the electronic tympanum, you know, out in front of Calarts. And um, after he took off his headphones, I just said, hey, how are you? I just want to introduce myself. I teach at a college over here. Hey, anybody ever ask you questions about your worldview? No. I said, do you think you lean more toward Eastern mysticism or the biblical scriptural worldview? It was all Eastern mysticism. I have my, my, my own guru. I said, well, can I ask you some four worldview questions? Yeah, go ahead. So I asked him the four questions, he kind of stumbled through them, kind of gave him an Eastern mysticism answer, and I said, can I give you the biblical answer to these four? He goes, please do. And I gave him a very patient explanation of how God sent Christ and it's our only hope, 
only restoration through him, and Adam's ruin only reversed by the death and resurrection of Christ. And afterwards he goes, man, I'm so glad I met you. Can I give you a hug? Now this is very strange, but a lot of times when I do this presentation, people express their gratitude. So, after you listen to the unbeliever's answers, ask if you may share the biblical worldview response to the four questions. And they've given you permission to share the gospel. It is just awesome. Now, you gentlemen are wise enough in advance to fill in the answers, but I'll just give you the answers real briefly here. In answer to the first question, we're created in God's image to know God. He made us in His likeness so we might have fellowship with Him. Our worth, our dignity, and purpose are bound up in the fact that we are created in the image of God. And God has an absolute claim upon us in the perfect blueprint for us, found in His Word. What's gone wrong with the world? When our first parents broke faith with God, sin entered the world as a destructive principle. It's the cause of idolatry and death and suffering and ignorance and fear and separation from God. Sin is behind war, injustice, oppression, and greed. What can we do to fix it? Well, God has a perfect plan to restore man to his created purpose of knowing God, loving Him, worshiping, serving, and enjoying Him. The only begotten Son of God came to earth 2,000 years ago to explain God to man and to lay his life down in crucifixion as a perfect sacrifice and substitute. Only by Christ's death is sin put away and forgiven, and only by Christ's death are men and women forgiven and restored to their created purpose to enjoy God and fellowship with him. And yet there is a necessary response to receive Christ, and that is faith and repentance. Is there anything stopping you today from calling upon Christ as Savior from your sin? And so when I present the gospel, I bring them to that point. I want to discuss it with them. I want them to know that the way we come to God is by coming to Christ, and the way we come to Christ is as a broken sinner in need of forgiveness. On the biblical side, the word of Christ is our method of knowing, our starting point. And on the unbeliever's side, self is the method of knowing. And so I want to expose that. I want, I want to bring that to the surface. I want him to see that. And so I make that a point of contact in my communication with him. I want to set up an antithesis to show him the two proposed sources of authority. Now there's ways to do this that are very winsome. I was talking to a theater arts major from CalArts, a very athletic black man, great physicality, very handsome man, and he was writing a theater, he was writing a play at Starbucks. And so uh, I'm there, I brought some guys there to witness. And so I said to him, hey, excuse us for interrupting, I, I, I'm, you probably, probably don't want to lose your thought or concentration you're studying here, but I'm just guessing, because you're studying at Starbucks, you kind of want, you want to be around some people. Is that true? He goes, yeah, that's true. I could use the break. So just a winsome opener sometimes is very powerful. So tell me what you're writing. And he talked about his play, his work that he's writing, and this and the other. I said, well, can we just ask you a few questions about worldview? Certainly worldview comes into theater arts, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. So he told me he had a particular spirituality which was completely esoteric, totally Hinduistic, Zen, Buddhistic worldview of spirituality. In other words, Spirituality comes from introspection, meditation, the divine within. And I said, has anybody ever shared with you how opposite the Holy Scriptures are from that? That all true spirituality is not esoteric, it's exoteric. It must come from outside of you. No. So I set up an antithesis in the greatest terms of bold contrast possible. Now he thanked me, but he said he was still esoteric by the time we finished our conversation but at least he saw the difference. So I want to encourage you guys to use antithesis. Our Lord did this, the Apostle Paul did this, and that is set up a collision between worldviews. Set up a collision between worldviews. See, the unbeliever also has a doctrine of God, a doctrine of sin, and a doctrine of salvation. Even atheists do. They have a set of ethics. They have a set of, of what 
you know, where you measure your life as successfully spiritually. Everybody has a doctrine of God, a doctrine of sin, and a doctrine of salvation. And so it's easy to set up the antithesis with them. It's very easy. And so after I listen to them, I present the gospel as the exact opposite of what they believe. The exact opposite. See, because of conscience, antithesis is your friend. Because of conscience, setting up a contrast is your friend. God is saving people through these collisions. Now, we haven't really exposed the sinner's love of darkness until we've taken him on at the point where he challenges God's word, where he judges God's word. So I want to set that up. I was witnessing to some students from CalArts out in front of Starbucks. And this young woman, I, I, I've never seen arrogance at her level. She said of herself, I'm accepting of all worldviews, of all philosophies, and all religions, and I hold every one of them in the deepest respect. And if your God is fair, he will do what I do. I about backed away when the lightning was going to hit. Incredible. Another young woman came up to us. She just, you know, in a good mood. And so she and her girlfriend had bought these little honey sticks. And they're giving out honey sticks that they bought at Vaughn's Market. And I said, oh, wait, wait, wait. Don't go away yet. Thanks for the honey sticks. Can we just ask you some worldview questions? And so we asked her the worldview questions. And the whole set of answers she gave was all about self. Self was the authority. Self was the goal. Self-realization was the, was the measurement of spirituality. And I said, is there a name for what you believe? And her name was Drea. And she goes, no, there's no name for what I believe. I said, I, I know the name of what you believe. She goes, you do? I said, yeah, the name of your religion is called Dreaism. It's the worship of yourself. Now, she was not insulted by that. <clears throat> she didn't walk away. And so we said to her, have you ever read the Bible? She goes, no, not really. Why not? Well, I've never had one. Right then my friend who was witnessing with me said, well, I'm going to give you my Bible. And so he gave her his Bible at that point. She had no excuse not to read the Bible at that point. So God has set up an antithesis, a collision between the wisdom of God at the cross and the supposed wisdom of the world. Now, God is doing this publicly. He's doing it as a massive collision. He's, gonna, he's doing it as a grand demonstration. And, and this is what God is doing. He's putting the world's wisdom on display as complete folly and foolishness. And he's doing so through, and Paul is using interesting language. He says, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And what he's basically saying there is, the cross of Christ fails the test for Greek wisdom because it doesn't make sense that a God should die for wicked people. And the cross of Christ fails the test that Jews have, which is power and mighty deliverance for the cross allowed Christ to perish under the curse of God. And yet, for us who are being saved, it is the power of God, it is the wisdom of God, it is the might of God. All right, uh, questions from you gentlemen. I've given you a ton of information here today, um, but we can boil it down into just a basically a few things, how to use worldview evangelism. Uh, I teach apologetics here, and I've written apologetics curriculum for a number of years. So there's just a lot of material. And I do have some YouTube videos, how to dialogue with postmodern people. I've got a YouTube channel, you can look it up. I use apologetics and evangelism. I have a question. Sure. I've been on my heart for a while, and my wife was, uh, she had been talking to my mom a long time ago. Did your mom not say? No, she said. Yeah. Uh, she uh, my mom 
said that someone had told her that <clears throat> I would have a hard time witnessing the people when I come back home, or even if I were to go to seminary and become a preacher, I would have a hard time preaching to people because of who I was before I had left the Navy. I joined the Navy back in 2006, and I haven't lived, I lived at home for like a year before I came out here to sure. see. And uh, so my question would be like, how do you witness the people you once were interacting with, if you had built a relationship with, and they knew you, but you were like in sin that whole time they knew you, and then you come back like years later, totally different person, like how do you, how do you get them to listen to you, and not disregard you, like as a hypocrite or something? Oh yeah, I mean I faced that problem because I got saved out of a party fraternity beach bum lifestyle in Southern California, and my closest friends were my partners in sin before I was saved. And so when I went back to him, I was witnessing to one guy only a couple months after I got saved. And he goes, man, we got nothing in common anymore. I can't believe you're buying into this. He goes, I believe in, in, the, in science. You believe in magic. I mean, he just really unloaded on me. And uh, it really troubled me a great deal. So it was very difficult. But Terrence, here's one of the things to think about. Um, we are trophies of God's grace. We are witnesses, not only in our testimony, but in our changed lives. Our changed lives are exhibit A of the power of God. And so when you're born again, the Father puts a new disposition in you to love God, to love holiness, to love righteousness, to love the people of God, to have compassion for the lost. And so you become a product of the product. One of the most powerful um, proofs of the gospel is your changed life. And we can never discount that. And so sometimes we need to use that to our advantage. To say to our unsaved friends who knew us before, remember what I was like? You probably think that my following of Christ is a temporary thing. You probably think my following of Christ is an attempt to minister to my conscience. You probably think my following of Christ is, is a momentary bout of eccentricity and, and fanaticism. I want you to know something. I have met God. I have met the Lord of the universe. In Christ, I have met my Creator. I, if, you know, how can you discount the experience I've had in a clear conscience, in being forgiven and loved by God? Now you have, and I say to my unsaved friends sometimes, you have no compendium of knowledge to evaluate what I'm saying because you've never been forgiven. All your sins are still on your conscience. You've never had your conscience washed by the blood of the Son of God. And so there's a way to talk to them that's not demeaning, it's not condescending. It acknowledges what you are, what you were, and it also acknowledges what you are now, giving God the full credit. Because they're going to try to explain your Christianity in naturalistic terms. You're just on some religious kick rock. And see, they're not doing that simply because they don't want to follow Christ. They're doing that to buffer their conscience. Because, I mean, Jesus said, those who do not gather with me scatter from me. In other words, your zeal is one of the things produced by the cross. Your zeal is traceable to the cross. Titus 2.14. He gave himself for us that he might deliver us from every evil deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. And so as long as you keep tracing this back to the cross and to Christ, um, their conscience is going to be harrowed in the process. Uh, it's going to be uncomfortable for them to be around you. Mm -hmm. That's just one thing I would do. And, uh, I don't, with people who knew me in my career of sin, uh, I will offer proofs if they ask, but I will primarily focus on the moral change and the change of heart that 